Now somebody told me there's a cave around these parts somewhere. Somebody said if you go looking in the, the deep, dark crevices, you might find an entrance to it somewhere. Has anybody seen a cave around here? Anybody? Betty, have you seen a cave? No. <laughs> One of the things about caves is they're always dark and gloomy and damp. To be blunt with you, I didn't want to dirty up my suit this morning, being in this cave. You know, morning, this morning we're going to talk about kind of what it's like to be in a cave. At least that's what we're talking about in the sense that some of you, or some of us I should say, when we exercise one of our spiritual disciplines of prayer. We wait till we get down that deep, dark cave and we call out, nobody's there, seems to be there. We listen, we don't hear anything, but maybe a trickle, a little bit of water, maybe a bat. Who got these bats in here? Who got these bats in here? You know, this week we're going to have the kids in here doing cave quests. Vacation Bible School. I wanted to hold off that announcement at this time of the day because I want everybody watching on the internet to come and be a part of it. Folks upstairs, y'all can turn the lights back on now if you want to. Just trying to make a point. I wish I could have made this announcement about 10 o'clock at night <laughs> when it'd be really dark in here and all the lights be out and, and nothing glowing except the eyes on that bat. But then again, if you have any kind of sense at 10 o'clock at night, where are you at? In bed. In bed. But Cave Quest, Vacation Bible School, we're going to have the kickoff at 5 o'clock this evening. The, re or the registration begins at 5. The, the festivities begin about 5.45 with a meal on across the street. And then the, the events themselves begin at 6.25 over here, I believe. So looking forward to that. So kids of all ages, internet, if, you're, if you get to see this, this will be online. By the time this comes online, we'll already start it, but it's not too late for you to be a part of it. We'd love to have you here at Buffalo Baptist Church Vacation Bible School. This morning we'll talk about prayer. Go ahead and turn the screen on to that. The title of the message is, And When You Pray. And When You Pray. By the way, how do you like my rope for cave dwelling? I figure that, any time, that, that a, a rope that's used to tie a boat to a dock can surely be used for exploring a cave. Am I right? Can you get an amen in the house? I, I didn't have much cave exploring equipment, but I got what I was able to have. This morning is where we continue in the study of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6 is where we're at. If you'll make your way there. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus really begins some practical instruction. To those who've been listening to this sermon of his, in, in the, uh, chapter 5 he began, we talked about this uh, in, in last week, how we studied earlier in the year the, the section called the Beatitudes, the pronouncements of blessing. Jesus does give these pronouncements of blessing on different pe uh, people and situations they find themselves in. And when we look at that from the surface, we say that doesn't look to be very blessed in those situations. But Jesus is trying to give us a more eternal, heavenly perspective of what it means to be blessed. And then after that, he goes into talking about relationships and, and, and what it means to be a disciple, etc. In, in the balance of chapter 5. Well, in chapter 6, he really begins this practical application, if you would, this practical exhortation, things we can do to put our faith to work. Last week, we took a look at how we call it being a kingdom MVP, and that an MVP is somebody who, who makes a huge contribution, although they're not necessarily the best player on the team, so to speak. That each of us can make a huge kingdom contribution, keeping in mind that it's not about us. Listen, we're not seeking after notoriety or our name to be, to be recognized. We're not seeking any reward from a human perspective. What we're looking for is to, to honor God, to bless God, and glorify the name of Jesus Christ. And when we do that, we can be a kingdom MVP. This morning, what's that? <laughs> the 
as long as the bears don't start moving, I'm okay. You know, I'm okay. But, but, uh, does anybody know where I was at? <laughs> but, but at any rate, today we're, we're going to look at about prayer. About prayer. Matthew chapter 6, beginning of verse 5, Jesus gives us some really practical instructions on prayer. So I'm going to ask you to turn there, if you haven't made your way to that already, Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 5, we'll eventually read through the end of verse 15. We'll start off with just the, the few opening verses to begin with. I'm going to ask you if you're willing and able to rise with me as we honor God's Word this morning. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. You follow along in whatever translation you have. Your neighbor will share with you if you don't have a copy of God's Word. And Jesus... The words of Christ were recorded here. And Jesus says, beginning verse 5, <clears throat> When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But, when, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Verse 7, And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. We'll pause right there. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading and hearing of His Word. You may be seated. You may be seated. One of the things that stands out to me about this passage is when we read this, when Jesus is giving these practical instructions on prayer, He does so with a supposition. He is already assuming that something is taking place. The words that He uses it three times, verse 5, verse 6, and verse 7. He uses the phrase or derivation of it, and when you pray. And when you pray. Jesus is assuming that we are already praying. Jesus is assuming that that is a practice we've already embraced. Jesus is assuming from these words that we already have some type of a relationship with God the Father where we pray to Him. And the implication is, if you do not have that relationship, you need that relationship. And when you have that relationship, certainly you will want to, to nourish that relationship by maintaining an ongoing prayer relationship. So I believe one of the first things Jesus tells us, this is not in your notes, is, is that if you do not have an active prayer life, you need to begin so right now. Amen? You need to spend time with God the Father. You need to spend time with God the Father. Michael or Jonathan, I'm going to put you to the task. I forgot to get my flipper. So I'm going to tell you when to advance the screen. Okay, I forgot to get it from the back room back there. But, but the, the outlines include within the context of your bulletin, we're going to begin with point number one right now. Jonathan, go ahead and make that screen. Contrary to what many people think, there is a wrong way to pray. Contrary to what many people think, there is a wrong way to pray. When we look at this passage and the words of Christ, when He's exhorting those people on the banks of the Sea of Galilee back in the first century, back really towards the beginning of his ministry there, as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. And he's talking to these people. Certainly there are some in there who, who did have a prayer life, but it's not what it should be. Certainly there were some who were there who had a, a prayer life which was not effective. There were certainly some in that room, or that, that gathering that day, some in this room even today, when, the, when they prayed, they wondered why... They seem to get no response from God for it. Now don't get me wrong. I do not believe that everything we pray to God for, He will answer the way we want it. Amen? You, you ask those prosperity gospel preachers, they will tell you, you, know, you just pray the right way, you do the right things, of course you give to their ministry, and you will be blessed financially. I am not one of those. 
I am not one of those. In fact, in my own life, I have found that God oftentimes, when He answers my prayer, it's just the opposite of what I was hoping He would tell me. And I'm sure many of you have found that the case as well. But there is a wrong way to pray. And Jesus begins talking about that in verse 5. The first example He gives is of people who are, and He calls them hypocrites. And He says, don't be like the hypocrites. And this is what the hypocrites do. And He talks about they go outside, they find a street corner, obviously a busy part of town, uh, a a bustling uh, activity going on. They stand there, they want to appear righteous before men. So they stand up and with some kind of eloquent voice and a loud projecting tone, they're able to to say these words and and what they're really hoping for is what? Are they really praying to God? Is that what they're looking for? What is it Jesus says they're looking for? The attention of man. They're looking for the attention of man. And that's point the sub-point number one, Jonathan advanced that. Sub-point number one is a wrong way to pray is when your prayer is simply intended more to be heard by man than by God. If you are just praying in a way to appear righteous before man, and maybe, maybe even you're praying to God and you're using some, some great type of, of uh, uh, expressions or whatnot, and, and, and you're trying to convince God you're righteous, that, that ain't going to cut it, folks. God knows what's in the heart. Amen? And your prayer has to reflect what is in your heart. If your prayer is just to make you appear to be righteous or or more faithful or a a better Christian than you really are, God's probably not going to honor that prayer. Jesus says that is a wrong way to pray. Sub-point number two there is it depends on lofty words or repetition. Jesus talks about that in verse 7 where He says that that uh, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose they'll be heard for their many words. There's not a set vocabulary for prayer. There's not a set language for prayer. What God wants is authenticity. Amen? He wants us to be real with Him. He wants us to confide in Him, to trust in Him, to depend on Him, to be honest with Him, up front with Him. How many of y'all have ever told God you're mad at Him? I have. I've told God I'm mad. I don't like the way you handle this situation, God. I think God honored the prayer I had. Does that mean God's going to apologize to me and say, Ray, I won't do that again? No, not at all. But I, but I do believe God honored me when I used that type of prayer because I was honest with Him. I was frustrated with Him. I I, I was angry with God. Now, is that healthy to be angry with God? No, it's not healthy to be angry with God. But when you are angry with God, if something happens in your life that you do not understand, that God could have prevented, God could have changed the circumstances, God could have made it different, if you are angry with God, it is healthy to let God know that. He already knows it. Amen? He knows what's in your heart. But He wants you to tell Him what is on your heart. He wants you to speak with Him as you would the most trusted person you know in the world. Maybe it's your parent. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your best friend. Whoever it is, God wants you to confide in Him like you would in them. Amen? He wants us to be real with Him. Now, when I was preparing this and I got down to verse 7, I got to thinking... I'm not saying anything bad about this guy, you know, but, but he was an old school preacher. How many of y'all like old school preachers? I do. Hey, Amen, I love them when, when, they, when they tell it like it is. You know, I like to emulate them some, and sometimes that ticks people off. I don't care. It's God's words, not mine. Amen? It's God's words, not mine. All I'm doing is telling you what the Bible says. But this old school preacher, he, he, I don't even know if he's still living now, but he was in one of the churches we were at. He was serving as an interim pastor there. He had been retired. We were between pastors. We called him as interim pastor. And he had this, this great conversational tone with you. And, and he, he would converse. He was a friendly guy, easy to converse with and all that. But as soon as he went into prayer mode, his voice would change. He would use the King James version of 
of speaking. Oh, Lord, my God. How great thou hast been to us, your humble servants. Stuff like that. I'm not saying nothing negative about the guy not intending to. And I'm sure his motives were genuine. But God doesn't want us to change who we are when we pray. He wants us to be who we are when we pray. Amen? It doesn't matter if you use the King James language or the, the tone of voice, inflections, whatever. He wants you to be real with Him. I want you to be real with Him. There is a wrong way to pray. Amen? So point number two, is there a better way to pray? What, and if so, what is the better way to pray? Look at verse 6 again. Jesus says, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who's in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The subpoint number one under this, or letter A, would be conversing with God alone. Conversing with God alone. Contrary to those who are just trying to be seen by men. It's conversation between us and God. Now when we pray in a corporate setting like this, does that mean we should not have one person voice the prayer for the congregation? I don't believe that's the case. I believe we should. And we do. We, we say prayers at the beginning of the service. We say prayers at the end of the service. Sometimes in the middle of the service. I hope you're praying right now. They're during the service. But, but the point is, sometimes we have corporate prayer. And when I ask somebody to pray on a corporate level, one of you today will be surprised at the end of the service because I'll call your name out and ask you to dismiss us in prayer. And you'll be praying for the, on behalf of the congregation. But again, even then... It's not a public performance. It's you voicing a prayer for us. So be real with God. Amen? Even if you're on a pulpit at, at, in front of the church on Sunday morning, or you're praying to open the next Franklin Graham crusade, whatever the case may be, you know, if you're praying for people, it's still you're praying to God who hears the condition of your heart. Amen? So there's a better way to pray. Converse with God alone. And then verse 7. Point B would be, go ahead Jonathan, simply tell God what is in your heart. Simply tell God what is in your heart. Contrary to what Jesus talks about in verse 7, He's talking about this meaningless repetition using this, this prayer language as quote the Gentiles do. He's saying... Basically, just pray, tell God what's in your heart. Again, if you're mad with God, tell Him. If you're happy with God, tell Him. If you're joyful, tell Him. If you're discouraged or scared or lonely, tell Him. Let Him know because He's the source of all comfort. He's the source of peace. He's the source of protection. He's the source of joy, of healing. He's the one that can relieve your pain. Tell God what's in your heart. Amen? So there's a wrong way to pray. What's a wrong way to pray? Repetitious, just saying words for the sake of sounding good. Praying to be heard. Praying to appear righteous and more righteous than you are. Trying to impress men and women. That's a wrong way to pray. A right way to pray is get real with God. Get alone with God. If you're in a corporate setting, still... Put yourself in a, a posture of prayer and pray to God as if you and He are the only ones conversing. Amen? Be real with God. So Jesus he gives a lesson here, then He says, let's, let's practice this. Point number three is uh, the model prayer. In the King James Version is what we're going to use today. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Go put that up there. And you'll see on the screen, this is the King James Version. Jesus said, and, I, and I'll read his introduction here, from the New American Standard Bible, it says, pray then in this way. And then he gives them this model prayer. We know it is the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm using the King James because that's the most familiar. That's the one that I memorized as a child. Perhaps most of the people in this room, many of you in this room, if you memorize the Lord's Prayer, that's the version you, you learned it by. New American Standard and the other translations say it's the same thing, just slightly different. But this, I love the language of the King James in this case. And when we look at the model prayer, there are some things in there. I, now, this is something I don't believe Jesus is saying. I don't believe Jesus is saying, when you pray, these are the words to use. Don't get me wrong. He's not saying that these are the words to use. How many of y'all were taught any type of prayer when you were a child? Any type of prayer? You know? well, what's, what, what's a prayer that everybody learned as a child? What, what's one of them? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to sleep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That's what I learned as a child. Yours may be slightly different than that. What's another prayer you learned? God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food and all the many blessings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now for years and years and years and years and years, I would say that prayer. As I got to be an older teenager, I would start to use that King James inflected voice when I prayed. God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. And then I remember one day at the dinner table, it's my time to pray. We're sitting around as a family. I'm probably, I don't know, 15, 16 years old. Dad points to me, asks me to pray. And what did I pray? Now I'll lay me down to sleep. I got it all wrong. I got it all wrong. It's not the words. Jesus is not saying when you pray, use this prayer. But pray like this. Pray like this. Some of the things we can take from the Lord's Prayer. Point number one is this. Worship God. The prayer begins, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What's that mean, hallowed be thy name? What's another way of saying that? Your name is holy. You are holy. God, you are holy. Holy, you are worthy of worship. Jesus is saying we should worship God in our prayers. Do you agree with that? I certainly do. That we should take some matter of time and effort and devotion to worship God even when we're praying. Even when we're in the deepest, darkest cavern or cave. We're scared for our lives. We're lonely. We're lost. We're in despair. We're hoping to be rescued. Salvation. Even then, we can worship God. Amen? Worship God. So a model prayer, part of that is worshiping God. Okay. Point B, Jonathan. Pray for God's will to be done. What's the Lord's Prayer say? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Praying for God's will. Praying for God's will. Just this past Friday, Robin and I made an unplanned, unscheduled, spur-of-the-moment trip to Durham, North Carolina. A friend of mine up there, he served in the, still serves in the first church I pastored, Bahama Baptist Church, a man by the name of Don Cook. On Thursday, as I'm looking at Facebook... I noticed that two of his grandchildren posted on Facebook under his name that previously he had been given three to seven days to live. Three to seven days. Don had cystic fibrosis. Is that what it is, you medical people? Is that the thing of your lungs? Am I correct? What, but he had to have a double lung transplant. And he had this double lung transplant in, in, in the year 2014. And all was going well until very recently. And now, two years after the transplant, his body is rejecting his lungs. His body is rejecting his breath. The doctors looked and they, they, they did all their testing and everything. They came to the conclusion and they told him, so there's nothing more we can do for you. And we expect within the next three to seven days, 
you will perish from this life. Well, that was I didn't learn about that till day seven. So we went and saw Don on day eight. Day eight of this prognosis. We spent some time with he and his wife, Laura. Beautiful couple, wonderful people, faithful men and women, or man and woman of, his, of God, servants in the church, love them dearly. And, to, and we spent some time with them reminiscing and just talking, and at the end we prayed with them. And part of my prayer is, God, we don't know what you got planned. We have no idea. The doctors tell us it's hopeless. I told Don, or I said in the prayer, I says, God, until you make it clear otherwise, we're going to pray for healing. We're going to pray for some type of a miracle. I says, God, until you make it clear otherwise, that's what we're going to pray for. But in any case, we trust you, God. We depend on you, God. Our faith is in you, God. And whatever your will is for Don and Laura, that's what we want to pray for. So we pray for God's will. And sometimes that's a hard prayer to pray for. When we have a loved one, a parent, a child, a spouse, who is deathly ill, all we want to pray for is healing. And that's what we would want, amen? If we were God, that's what we would do. We'd bring healing. But God doesn't always bring healing. I think of the story of Lazarus and how when Lazarus was sick, Mary and Martha, his sister, sent word to Jesus. Said, Jesus, the, the one whom you love is ill, very ill. They knew that Jesus could bring healing. They had seen Jesus heal people. They had seen Jesus take the blind man and give him sight. They had seen Jesus clean the leper, take the lame person, help him to walk. They had heard that Jesus had even risen, taken somebody and had, or rose, or gave him life again. And they knew that if anybody could save their brother, it was Jesus. So they called for Jesus to come. But Jesus didn't come. At least not right away. When Jesus did finally come, Lazarus was already dead. You know the story. Lazarus is dead. He'd been in the tomb for four days. Mary or Martha said to Jesus, said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would live. And Jesus said, he will rise again. Well, she thought he was talking about the, the resurrection of the end times. The other sister comes out there, Mary, and they're weeping terribly, and Jesus basically says, go to the grave goes to the grave and tells, tells them to roll away the stone. Then he prays to heaven. He looks up and he prays to God. And he thanks God for what God's about to do. And then he calls that grave and says, Lazarus, come forth! And Lazarus rose from the tomb and walked out. Amen? Amen? His will there was to bring Lazarus to life. And oftentimes we pray, God, if you did it for Lazarus, why can't you do it for us? In the last church I pastored, we had two people. Both of those diagnosed with cancer. Both of those we entered into heavy prayer for. Both of those we sought after healing in our prayer times. We, we prayed hours upon hours and hours combined as a congregation. One person... Was, was, was cured of their cancer, declared cancer-free. The other perished, and we held a funeral before I left up there. Buried them in the church cemetery. Why did God answer the one prayer for healing and not the other? We don't know. But we do know God always responds in accordance with His will. And part of the pur purpose of praying for His will to be done is to help us accept His will Whatever that is, amen? To pray for God's will to be done. So we need to worship God. We need to pray for God's will to be done. Verse 11, point C, we need to ask for His provision. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Now if I'm praying that prayer, 
and I am going to be very selfish about it, and I want to pray for my provision, I'm not going to ask for God just to meet my needs. Amen? I'm going to ask God to give me prime rib for dinner. Prime rib. Can I get an amen in the house? Hey, can I get an amen, brother? Yeah, you know, get, get some prime rib. Or maybe some fresh, fresh cooked fish. You know, I, you know, I want the good. You know, but Jesus isn't saying that. He doesn't say ask for the best in life. What was bread in, in, in those days? It's just a sustenance item. It was a basic food element. That's all it was. It's a basic means of sustaining life. Today, bread is often a side dish or something like that. We, we have bread in addition to our meal. Back then, a bread oftentimes was the meal. And that's what it took to sustain life. We're asking God, give us what we need. Give us what we need. How many of y'all have Facebook? And are friends with me on Facebook? Some of y'all, didn't y'all think I looked great on that Harley? Did y'all not? Baby girl, back girl behind me, that smile on her face to interpret what she was thinking was, we need this. We need one of these. Yeah, we, we need one of these. I can just see me rolling through town that big old Harley Davidson motorcycle. Amen? Uh, yeah, I would love to have that. And if I was to start to pray for that, would God honor that? Probably not. Probably not. But when I pray for God to give me what I need, does He honor that? He's never failed. He's never failed. Amen? Amen? Pray for God's provision. Next point. Ask for forgiveness of sin. Ask for forgiveness of sin. King James Version says, forgive us our debts. Some translations say, forgive us our trespasses. Some of your translations maybe say, forgive us of our sin. There's also that stipulation in there, is there not? Forgive us our debts as what? We forgive our debtors. In other words, God is not so quick to offer forgiveness to us if we don't offer forgiveness to others. Amen? But, but, but remember that. Pray for forgiveness of sin. Ask God to forgive you your sin because you failed. Today, you've already failed God. This morning, you've already sinned against God. Somehow, some way, you've fallen short of what God expects of you this day. As have I and everybody else in this room. Ask for forgiveness of sin. Ask for His protection. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Ask for Him to protect us from the long tentacles of sin and the temptations that are out there in our lives. Each of us has different temptations. And we need to pray for God to, to let us be strong when we face that. Will we face those temptations in life? Certainly will. Will we face them on a daily basis? More than likely. We need to ask God for strength there. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. By the way, God never tempts you. When you are tempted, it is not of God. It is only of the deceiver, Satan himself. Amen? You know, God does not tempt you. Ask for His protection. And then finally, verse 13. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What's the point there? Worship God. Go right back where we started. Jesus is just emphasizing, strongly I believe, that part of our prayer life, a huge part of our prayer life, should be spent time worshiping the One we're praying to. Amen. Worshiping God the Father. Worshiping Jesus His Son. Worshiping the Holy Spirit that He sends. The triune God, the Holy Trinity. Worship God. Worship God. By the way, worship is not just an activity where we gather here in a corporate setting. Worship is a way of life for the one who's truly devoted to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? So Jesus today 
when you pray, don't be like a hypocrite just trying to be seen. Don't think there's some magic formula to prayer where you use repetitious words or lofty language or inflection of the voice. Don't try to fool man that you're more righteous than you are. Don't try to fool God that you're more righteous than you are. Be real in your prayer. And when you pray, make sure you worship God. Ask for His will to be done. You can't worship God and not want His will. Amen? There, there, there's a divide there. There's a, 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 a disparity there. You cannot worship God and not desire His will. Ask Him to provide what you need. Ask for forgiveness of sins. Ask Him to protect you. Especially in the area of sin in your life. Worship God. So this morning, let's all stand. Marsha, I'm going to ask you to come up and start praying. Our closing prayer this morning will simply be the Lord's Prayer. King James Version is on the screen there. In unison. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And lead us not into... T- and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father God, this day...